So then, <laughs> there was a sociologist at UBC who was studying sign language in sawmills. <laughs> Apparently, the noise in sawmills was so loud that they, the workers there would even tell jokes in sign language. <laughs> Clearly, I hadn't grasped the nature of the medium. <laughs> Can you tell one of those jokes now? <laughs> <laughs> so the third person I, I did was... Um, a woman, Frances Adaskin, who at the age of 72 was making her solo debut all her, on the piano, and all her life she'd been her husband, Harry Adaskin, the violinist accompanist. And I went out and I interviewed her, and she was gracious and articulate. And uh, that was my first on air piece on the morning radio show. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, I'm surprised you didn't uh, do any kind of poetry recitation, because I hear that you're quite good at that. Can we roll some tape now? Here's an example of one of the most famous 20th century poets, T.S. Eliot, reading from the beginning of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, muttering retreats and oyster shells on sawdust floors. Do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. Are you impressed? <laughs> <clears throat> Unrehearsed. That was good of the TSL archives. <laughs> Where did you get that? I don't know. Your producer gave it to me. Slipped it to me. I think it was Mary. The first time I was a guest on your show, I think we were talking about films and first films, and I said, I... I think the first film I saw was Scaramouche, which actually was a lie, but it was the right thing to say at the time. What was uh, the first film you saw? I, I can't tell you yet. Later on. Um, <laughs> do you remember the first movies, movies you went to? Yes, because, uh, again, growing up in Montreal, there, when I was growing up there, you, you couldn't go to movies under the age of 16 because there had been a terrible fire mm -hmm. and some kids had been trampled, and so you couldn't actually go to the movies in the, uh, in the city. So the first movies I remember going to were during a summer vacation. Uh, we had a whole gang of the family would uh, rent cottages in the country. And uh, there was a cinema in the nearby village. And, we, and I guess my, my mother must have taken us, because it seems to me, when I look back at it now, the most inappropriate movies for children. Uh, one was I Want to Live with Susan Hayward. <laughs> And the other is Mario Lanza. Uh, I think it was a biopic of uh, Caruso or something like that. But later, uh, the, we could go to movies at the, at the Y. They, they had like Saturday afternoon movies for kids, but I couldn't go to the cinema. And there I remember seeing movies like Bambi and, and Robin Hood. So, um, I mean, we've all done a lot of stuff on film, but when the first Writers and Company was being hatched, uh, what was the idea behind it, and how did that change? Do we all imagine it to be what it, what it in fact became? Well, when it started, it was, uh, the idea was to have more than one interview per program, and it was also going to have a little bit of performance, so there would be uh, more of a magazine format. And I think possibly the first interview that was actually a whole sh devoted to a whole show was with Nadine Gordimer. And because I remember in the introducing it and saying this is today a special program with Nadine Gordon. It was special because Nadine Gordon was special to me also because I was a huge admirer of hers. But also I think the fact that we devoted a whole program to one person. And then gradually realized that these whole program, one person shows, were getting a bigger response from listeners and were more gratifying and just had more stuff in them and more depth and more entertainment and and more to talk about, and uh, so that it, it evolved towards mm -hmm. focusing. Every now and then we do still have a, a two-person show, especially when we do a special series from a different country, so we'll bring some people together, or we'll have a panel. But the idea of, of a one-person show uh, wasn't there at the outset, but it, it's, it's evolved, and it's a, it surprises me, I suppose, in a, in a way that we didn't even think of it to be. It's, to me now, it's just the ideal format 
I mean, in my early, early, early days when we were talking about starting off in different programs on CBC, one of the first things I, programs I worked for when I started working full time for CBC Radio in Toronto was uh, the Arts Report. And that was one minute, 20 seconds, including a 40 second clip. <laughs> what I think of as the haiku of arts journalism. <laughs> So I kind of got to do, move from the haiku to the epic of... Uh... <laughs> well, in fact, your first season in 1990, you had writers such as Nadine Gordimer, A.S. Byatt, Kutzi. I think they all went on to do reasonably well. Um, <laughs> how did this fledgling show at attract names of such international stature? Well, some of the, they, uh, they weren't necessarily as well known then. And in fact, even Nadine Gordimer hadn't yet won a Nobel Prize. I, I, feel very pleased that we uh, interviewed a lot of people, we had mm -hmm. a lot of people on the show before they won Nobel Prizes. Uh, and uh, A.S. Byatt hadn't yet, she had just published Possession when I interviewed her on Writers and Company, but I'd actually interviewed her earlier when she was in Toronto with another book and she was here for the Authors Festival. And Nadine Gordimer, I was actually most nervous about before I interviewed her because I had, been it wasn't face to face, she was in Johannesburg, I was in Toronto, and um, I had been reading up about it, and I read somewhere that she had a tongue like a carving knife. <laughs> and so I was a little nervous. <laughs> And I, but it was one of those situations where my stomach was, even though we weren't face to face, like my stomach was just flipping. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked her one question and I could tell from the, it was, it was not a very, you know, it was not an original question. It was a very ordinary question. And I could tell from the generosity of her answer that she was going to be okay. And in fact, Nadine Gordimer is another person who was very influenced by libraries and talked about how she couldn't have been a writer if there hadn't been a library in this little town that she grew up on. And it, I was gonna, on, the, on, the, on the belt, and what I, I included her in this first book of interviews I had, and I remember when I was transcribing, I, got the, the, I, got, I hired somebody to, to do the transcription, I got it back and it said that Nadine Gordimer described growing up on the felt. <laughs> 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 and, and in the early days they would get together when she was at university, and this is another one of my favorites of, of transcriptions, where they would listen to uh, LP records of classical music of Shoster and Kovic. <laughs> <laughs> that old vaudeville company. <laughs> <laughs> so when you began, when you began to interview all these uh, writers, um, do you already know how to ask the right question in the right way? Was that something that kind of you learn to do properly, or were you perfect at it from the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had to learn. Yeah. I, I really did, and especially I had to learn my whole previous work, and I had interviewed a lot of create, uh, Canadian writers as a journalist in Vancouver, uh, mostly for print, and I had to learn the huge difference between interviewing for print and interviewing for radio. And even when I started in radio, I was a theater critic in Vancouver, and then when I moved to Toronto, even doing the arts report and then freelancing for, uh, well, not freelancing, but, but contributing as a writer broadcaster to the Arts Tonight with Sheila Rogers. I was a writer broadcaster, which meant I would talk and then I would bring in tape. So the actual interview that I did to get that tape did not require me to be present in the interview. Similarly, when I would interview for print, I didn't have to be present. So I would do an interview by aiming the microphone at positioning a microphone at the guest and then you know sort of murmuring in the background every now and then if I thought the guest needed a prompt. So I had to learn to be present even if relatively speaking and compared to some hosts on the radio I'm less present than, let me rephrase that. After all we might, we might leave this in, right? <laughs> so I had to learn to be present um, and make audible responses when uh, when people spoke and when they and so it wasn't just a question of asking questions, but I had to, I had to I had to be in the room. The listener had to know I was in the room, so I that, 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 I had to learn how to do that. Yeah. And 